All right, welcome to the fire pit, baby. Today's guest we're gonna roast is Kevin, but we're not gonna roast him. We wanna hear his story. We wanna know where he came from. What did he do? Where's he going? What's going on? Hey, Kevin, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. I can't wait to get my meat roasted. Put it on there. Spill your guts, buddy. All right, so basically, you know, you, you grew up where? I was born in Germany, grew up in Florida, uh, went through uh, some crazy times as a child. Uh, parents divorced when I was six. Remember the police coming in, dragging my father out. Why? Uh, I mean, violence? Yeah. Domestic violence? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my family, they dragged my mother out. <laughs> Okay. So we're similar. Uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, so uh, then uh, that ended up leading to us going from uh, having a, a nice home in the Weston Hills Country Club, had, you know, the ride on mower and the pool, to having uh, seven $20 bills in the bank account, and losing the home to foreclosure, moving into a tiny apartment, and coming out to go to school only to find that our car had been towed. So I heard a rumor from somebody that claimed to know you mm. back then. They claimed that not only did you lose your house, they came and repossessed the car, and you were sleeping in it. <laughs> yeah, they, they really wanted to repossess me. <laughs> they can't, can't send, send this guy back for a refund. The car got <laughs> repossessed, and he's possessed. Uh, yeah, it, it was a traumatic time. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I don't ever like to do the, like, woe is me or whatever. I, I'd like to start with that, though, because I've only over the last three or four months realized, I wonder if that's why I always have this nagging feeling of like, I, I gotta work, I gotta make another video, like, I gotta read another earnings report, I gotta do another deal. I, I, I never really put the dots together as to why I have that, that feeling. And I think it's because I know why. that was so traumatic. I don't, don't wanna go wanna back to that. You don't wanna be poor. I don't wanna be broke. I don't wanna go back to being broke. What's yep. with that? Well, it's, it's called ambition. Yeah. Who, you know, all right, you know, who doesn't want nicer things in life and want to have money and nice cars? What's wrong with that? As long as you're doing it, you're not hurting nobody, right? Yeah. That's well, what America's all about. I, I think I was also really able to learn lessons of pay off your debts so you don't have a 500 credit score and you can actually apply for loans, which is really important. So there were a lot of things I could look at my parents of, and I love them, and decide, okay, these are financial things I don't want to do. I'll do the opposite. Let me make sure I do my best to have a perfect credit score. Let's get into owning real estate that, worst case, if something goes wrong, like a divorce, we could rent it out and still cash flow on it. And so this, this was really important, and it's something that helped me a lot later. You went to high school, and then basically that's what a big transition in your life was. You went from a, a real nice upper middle class down to the rest of us, right? And then what happened? Yeah, so high school was uh, really uh, it, seeing my dad spend uh, every dollar that he had. This was going also through the Great Recession, so he uh, lost his job, his business. He closed his business, uh, uh, lost all of his employees, and, and took a job that was paying not enough for us to really get by. So. You know, high school started out a little rough, but as things got better and we got out of the Great Recession, uh, my father spent 3500 bucks on his credit card to send me on a, a European trip uh, when I was a sophomore. And that's where I met Lauren By yourself? Paris. Yeah, by myself with, with the school, but it wasn't for curriculum. It was sort of uh, extra curriculum. Basically, your father spoiled you, even when he didn't have the means to. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, and that's where I met Lauren. and. Uh, she, uh, you know, we were long distance for a year. I wanted to get her to go to college with me. She's a year older than me, so she was in college when I was uh, going to be a senior. And I said, come to college in Florida. Let's, let's have a life in Florida. No income tax. Hey, it's warm. The beaches are great. Come to Florida. And uh, Lauren's parents uh, had, had a unique strategy of putting a kibosh in the idea of their daughter leaving for a guy, you know, 3,000 miles away. Their strategy was, let's rent Kevin a room for $200 a month, Jack and Jill room connected to Lauren. How could he forego on that? Live in so a, they have meetings in the bathroom? Well, we had meetings. <laughs> uh, text you, I'll meet you in the bathroom in 10 minutes. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I, uh, after being long distance for a year, I moved in with her, uh, got a job at Jamba Juice, selling smoothies. That was after getting fired from a job at Hollister. 
Uh, you couldn't yeah. cut it a Hollister? Couldn't cut it a Hollister. No, I was a, I was a police explorer. They found out that I was uh, that I had anything to do with law enforcement, and my hours went from four shifts a week to zero. It wasn't for shoplifting. No. Okay. That's why I got fired. It's the only reason why I'm asking. Oh, oh. From another store. I've been fired from every job I ever had, except the army. And they didn't really care about keeping me here much. <laughs> they didn't mind losing. So basically, no. you, you know, you went there. You went. Did you go to college, or she just went to college? Yeah. So well, uh, I came uh, to California, and then I went to a community college for two years. And uh, because I did that, I was able to get in-state tuition for when I transferred into UCLA because I didn't do well in high school. So my high school grades, my SATs weren't great. I played video games all the time. So I went to a community college, which was super cheap. I got grants to go to community college because I had no money. It was really easy to qualify for grants. I had no money. And uh, then, because I was in state for two years, they let me use my straight A's at the community college to go to UCLA. And so I went there and learned business, economics, and political science, and debate, and communication. And uh, at the same time, decided to get my real estate license because that's what my in-laws did. Lauren, oh, your in-laws were in real estate. Lauren's mom was a property manager for 30 years. Uh, Bill, uh, uh, now my father-in-law, was a real estate agent for 30 years. And uh, they wanted Lauren to get her license and become a property manager and work with Connie and Bill in sales. And I thought, real estate? I don't really want to do that, but I don't think it hurts to get my license. So I just started studying for it. I was only going to high school. I mean, this was, I started studying for my real estate license in my senior year of high school. And I thought to myself, what else am I doing? I mean, I could take another shift to Jamba Juice and you know make 200 bucks or, or first deal. All right, so what was your first deal? <laughs> so my first deal, it was so hard to get clients because here I am, 18 years old with a real estate license. Who's gonna trust the 18 year old? So I had to try to look the part. I put my face on a Prius. I thought people would put your face on a what? Prius. A Prius. That's what we had before Tesla. That's right. Yeah, it was all, you know, California, so everybody's driving the Priuses. Anyway, put my face on a Prius, put a suit on, and tried making myself appear a lot bigger than I was. Uh, and uh, I started calling for sale by owners. Found one who was selling a six unit apartment building uh, in our downtown for. $90,000 a door, uh, super cheap, look in hindsight. I mean, the place now is probably worth two million bucks, but that was bottom of the market, you know, 2010, 2011. And uh, that was my first deal. It, I signed the listing January 23rd, about three weeks into getting my license. It took me nine months <laughs> to close the deal. But at the end of the year, I looked and I'm like, that one check, that one deal was more money than I made at Jamba Juice all year long working substantial hours every week. Commissions are great when they come in. They could, you know, you do one deal. Imagine if you make a, uh, if you got a job making, you know, 30, 40 grand a year, you could make that in one, two, three commissions. So, you know. I made myself a slave to those early clients. Whatever they wanted. I had one client, she really wanted me to find someone who would do owner financing for her because she didn't think she could qualify conventionally. I counted. I sent 787 emails, and including discussions with certain people who are potentially interested, to agents, uh, to, to uh, people selling their homes on Craigslist. In 2011, the market was rough, so people were trying to get creative and saving commissions, and uh, ended up still being able to qualify for conventional financing by the end of the year, <laughs> of course. But it did sell her a home. You know, at, at one point, I was ready to fire her because it was so much work, even though I had no money. Uh, I'm like, I just, I can't deal with the stress anymore. But she wouldn't let me fire her because I was basically her slave. Did you take her close to the cleaners? No, but basically You that remember what the commission was service. by the time you got done with this broad? Yeah, this was a, this ended up being a $600,000 sale and I was on a split at that time. So that was about, it was a, it ended up being a foreclosure that she bought and they gave 3% commissions on that. So that was 18,000 that I got about $10,000 of. So uh, that, my first year of real estate, I ended up closing so I closed a few right in the last few weeks of the year. Uh, ended up making $35,000, which was three times as much as I made, you know, making eight to $10,000, more than three times at Jamba Juice. All right, so you, you got into real estate by getting a license, selling real estate, busting your ass, making commissions, but when did you buy your first deal? 
Yep. When did you break your cherry? Ooh, when did I pop my cherry? Well then, <laughs> which cherry? <laughs> okay, so well, my real estate cherry. Uh, yeah. Well, that was in 2011. Beca right when I got my license. Now, I had no money other than Jamba Juice income. I had saved up about $9,000. Lauren saved up about $9,000. And we're like, what if we're gonna sell real estate? And I'm wearing a suit every day, and I'm being people's slaves, and I got my face on my car. You know, I'm a real estate agent. I gotta own the product. So we looked, we spent about four months looking for deals. And what was great about looking for deals was I finally, I put myself in the shoes of a buyer. I'm like, oh, okay, these are the questions I have. And so that way, when I dealt with other first time home buyers, I could educate them because I just went through the road myself. I mean, how could you sell somebody a home without having bought a home yourself? It's very, very difficult in my opinion. You gotta own your product. And so what we did, because we had no budget or no money, is we're like, okay, well, let's get a hard money loan because we couldn't qualify. But the rates then were like seven to eight percent for a hard money loan. Conventional loan was like four and a half percent. But we couldn't qualify for a conventional loan. So we were gonna get a hard money loan on uh, this foreclosure. No kitchen, no bathrooms we found. Bank of America foreclosure. We walk into the Bank of America branch, we're like, we want this deal. And the guy's like, okay, look, it's a Bank of America foreclosure. There are cash offers on it. It's listed for three or five, we got two cash offers. But the government's tired of us selling homes to investors. What can we do to give you a loan so we can tell the government we're putting a homeowner in, we get the loan, and we get the foreclosure? They make profit three times, basically. Government, foreclosure, and, and whatever, the other thing. The banks actually get special credits, which helps them be in the good graces of the federal government, which then gives them what they call federally funded money to loan out. So if they get points by giving them to certain people or certain areas, it benefits the bank. There's a certain term for it. I don't know. I forgot. But, you know, it's definitely true that that's why the bank wanted to play ball with you. That makes a lot of sense. So <laughs> we sit down and we're like, we can't qualify. Uh, I made 10,000 bucks at Jamba Juice. I just got my real estate license. I got, I got a deal in escrow. I remember telling them, like, I can't use that. The underwriter don't care about your commission check in escrow. And it ends up taking nine months cashes. anyway. <laughs> Until that clears, it means nothing. Uh, so he, he recommended, he said, can you find someone to co-sign? Because even though you could do the deal hard money, we could do the deal alone. If you co-sign, we can do the loan and then just refinance them off after you fix up the place because they knew it was a fixer and they lent us the money to renovate it to with an FHA 203K renovation loan. We're like, well, heck, okay. Called around, mom bankrupt, uh, uh, stepmom didn't want to do it. Dad, like, I don't know, man, you actually gonna stay in California? You know, you like flip-flopping and uh, I just spent all my money on a new motorcycle, <laughs> you know? And he's like, I, I don't have a dime to give you for down payment. Like, Dad, we're gonna do the deal anyway with a hard money loan. It, this would be cheaper for us. You would be helping us make this cheaper for us. And he said, all right, all right, but I, I can't put any money in. So we took out all of the money we had, put it into the deal. We knew we could rent it out for about $2,000 a month. The payment was $19.90. Wait, 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 wait. You said it's a 203 loan. Mm. That's a, you know, explain what that is. That's oh, yeah. So it's a renovation loan and it's a headache because you have to deal with a HUD inspector who you pay like six grand on a 50K renovation budget to come and basically do uh, checks of, all right, here's $10,000 to get started. Go buy materials for paint and the kitchen and the bathrooms because there was no kitchen and bathrooms. And then when I see the materials come, I'll write you another check. And so he comes and gives us sort of installment checks. He watches the bank's money yes, to make exactly. sure you don't piss it away. <laughs> That's right. But it was so slow. Remember the six unit apartment building seller guy? I'm like, I got this deal. It's in a $450,000 neighborhood. I'm paying 305 for it. We're gonna put 50 grand into it. But these installments, these draws are like six week waits. I'm sitting here losing my AWS on, on PITI because I'm not getting any work done. It's like, why don't I lend you 25 grand as a second on the property? There's plenty of equity. It's 150 grand of equity once it's fixed up. I'll lend you 25 grand so you can front the job 25 grand and then get your installment reimbursements and pay me off when you refinance it or, or once you get all of your installments up. So I was able to sort of merge that world of the six unit apartment building, uh, the Bank of America uh, deal, wanting to give me this loan and beat out the cash offers and my dad. 
uh, and give me money to fix it out. I mean, all of these pieces came together in such an incredible way. And what was beautiful is we spent most of our money at Ikea buying Ikea kitchens, Ikea closets. I put a lot of this stuff in myself, anything we can do to save money. And what was so great about that is we turned our home into what I called sort of the Ikea menagerie, where basically the first time home buyers would come and they'd look at a place with old cabinets and old bathrooms. I'd be like, come to my house. And I'd show them, we did this, here's exactly how much it costs, here are all of our receipts, here's how much the bathroom costs, here's who we use to use it. And all of a sudden I became invaluable, providing this value to, to new clients who are like, we don't know a painter or an electrician or where to get cabinets or what to do. Here, look at my house, copy what I did. Very good, you show people how to add value without spending a fortune. So you're selling real estate, you, you started, you got your own place cooking now, you're gonna rent out. And then um, you just kept growing, right? Yeah, uh, we ended up buying, on average, a property every year. And the market was obviously in an appreciating market. So what we did on the first deal is we refinanced it the next year when we could qualify a loan because now I had that 35K of income. Lauren had income from real estate too. And we combined this and were able to refinance, lowered our payment, even though we were taking a lower or larger loan out because rates fell a little bit. It's phenomenal. Uh, and then six months later, we get a home equity line of credit against it because the refinance brought us to 80%. Uh, the HELOC lender, a local credit union, let us go to 90%. <laughs> and the appraiser thought we were really a cute couple, so she kind of, you know. <laughs> hey, play any card you can. <laughs> so, I mean, the house was not, I mean, the refinance appraisal came in at, uh, I think, 500. The HELOC appraisal six months later came in at 560. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not complaining. We use that money to go buy another rental. This other rental, and this was the thing about buying local. I walk up to the other rental. The lady comes down the driveway. I'm like, Lauren, I'm holding an open house. And uh, in comes this lady to the, my open house. She's like, hey, would it be weird to have two for sale signs on the same street? I'm like, ding, 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 she wants to sell. And I'm like, oh, what do you got? Maybe we got a buyer. So I bring Lauren over and she shows us both the home. And Lauren's like, wait a minute. You were my guidance counselor in elementary school. And the lady coming to the house was like, Lauren? <laughs> like, Helps to know people. Cha-ching. <laughs> so basically the thing is, you, you know, you did what everybody should do and needs to do. You start off and you build and you keep recycling money, you keep tapping your equity out, and you keep growing. Yeah. yeah, what's really weird is I remember to this day, I started that year out when we bought our first rental, passing out flyers, door knocking, and I told myself, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I'm gonna knock on so many doors that I will buy a rental this year. I don't know, I don't know if the superstitions really work, but I, I told myself, I will get a rental this year. I will get a rental. I remember every step I looked at my, I will get a rental this year. And then that fell in my lap within two months and I'm just like, oh wow, that could work. <laughs> There's something to that. <laughs> and then now you've been in real estate how many years? Yeah, so now I've been in real estate 11 years. Uh, in the COVID pandemic, my uh, YouTube business made a lot of money. Uh, I was really fortunate with that. Well, we're all I stuck at home. We're all stuck at home, exactly. Might as well look at you. Yeah, you know, I took, so I was on a pace of buying one home a year until COVID. And the COVID pandemic hit, and I was watching the market week by week in March, going, wait a minute. There's a little bit of a lull here, but it looks like prices are actually going up and inventory is going down and rates are getting cut. All three of those to me were like alarm the stars bells. stars have aligned. Again, that like real estate's about to explode. And so in 2020, I bought eight properties in one year. I took every dollar I made. I'm like, buy, 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 real estate. Buy, buy, buy. Doesn't that stock guy do that? <laughs> yeah, Jim Cramer. <laughs> Although usually people just do the opposite of what he does and it works out well. But <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, yeah, that was, that was really great. But it, for me, I love reading the, the tea leaves of the market. Now we're in a situation here at the beginning of 2022, or we're in May already, middle almost. Well, I know you, you do have a lot of talent. I walked into my big house project I'm working on. Uh, you got a lot of talent. You know what you're doing. You know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm not going to listen to you because I don't want to spend the money on most of that stuff, even though you're probably right. But, you know, I like to take my own shortcuts. But, um, you know, besides you being heavy into real estate, 
<coughs> you know, you got your YouTube channel. And, I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I'm sure you feel the same way I do. When you're successful at something, you want to see other people be successful. At least yeah. that's the way, we're a certain breed, I think, maybe. If the whole world acted like that, and everybody helped everybody, imagine what a perfect world this would be. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, there is a lot, I think, of uh, people not wanting to give their competition information or whatever. But, and when I started on YouTube, I had, I had a little bit of that, and it's a terrible thing. Uh, like, I'd do exposed videos or this, that, or whatever, and got sued over it. Or, Anyway, I learned that the more you give, the more you get. The more value you give, the more money you make. And, and I think now, the, one of the most important lessons for people to take away always is, if you're at a job and you're thinking, how can I make more money, or my boss doesn't seem to value me, or, or whatever, I think it should always start with, what can you do to provide more value, and, and then, you should expect to see results, but first provide that value to others. Right, you have a right almost. If you created value, yeah. you got you have a right that you know you can say, hey, listen, you know, you're making an extra ten grand a month because of me. You know, I mean, if people have to appreciate you too. If you if you work with people who don't appreciate you, you're never yeah. gonna go nowhere. Yeah. I've had jobs where I knew these guys were not, and this was in real estate. I took a job once because, uh, you know, I felt like I wanted to stabilize my life somewhat, and and I knew these big shots they were gonna keep me right where I was at, and I was making them money. Uh, so I had to move on on my own, and really they did me a favor. Oh, yeah. Because if they didn't show me that I had no big future with them, I never would have got off of my own, and I never would have made it to the level I'm at today. Yeah, that's so valid. I mean, if you believe with all your heart that you're providing so much value and constantly improving the value you provide to a business, and then you go to a boss like Ben, you say, Ben, I'm providing more value. You asked me to learn this, I learned it. What can I do to learn more and provide even more value? And then you do that. And then six months later, you're like, Ben, all right, I did that now. Now I want to know how I can get to the next level, but I'd also like to ask for more pay so I can continue to grow with you. If you don't get the raise at that point, and you've constantly been providing more value and fulfilling your duties, well, it's like you said, you've hit a ceiling there and it's time to move on. But if then Ben says, you know what, you're right. We'll move your pay to this, but now to get to the next level, can we get you doing this, this, this? And you know what I'd say if you were that person? Mm -hmm. You know what I would say if you were that person? Well, to me, you'd probably say you're fired. You're fired! <laughs> he guessed it! <laughs> He's pretty smart. <laughs> ben, uh, you know, I've got an opening at my company. You, want, you looking for a job? I wouldn't fit in your opening. <laughs> you talk about stocks. You, uh, you're, you're into crypto. Are you a cripper? I'm not much of a cripper. Uh, in fact, one of the probably biggest mistakes that I've made, whether it comes to stocks or, or crypto, is sometimes I feel obligated to invest in a company, not because I think it's a great company or a great investment, but because I'm talking about it. That somehow, like, I can't talk about it unless I'm also an owner in it. And, and that was a really big mistake on YouTube that I've learned that there are some companies that I'm, I look back and I'm like, why did I invest in that company? I didn't, I never should have been in that company. And then I lose money on it. But then I think back did to- Did you well, tell other people to buy it? Uh, a lot you of- You rat. Well, a, a lot of companies, for example, I'll give you Nobody's a few got examples. Nobody's a crystal ball. No, of course not. So for example, some companies like Nano Dimension or Plug Power, for example, here are companies that went from $3 to $70 and $17, respectively. Massive growth. But it's not because of their earnings. No, no, it's no. speculation. That was speculation momentum. Which pays These, off a lot of times. Oh, yeah. These are companies that I remember making videos on and saying at near the tops, these are getting ready to flip. Here's what the CEOs are saying. Here's what they're doing. Here's why I think they're likely to go down. But then there are other companies where I'll get caught up in this, oh my gosh, uh, this company's blowing up. Like for example, this company, Affirm, is a company that I, I love the buy now, pay later model. And sometimes I feel like, hey, I wanna talk about buy now, pay later. I wanna talk about consumers. I wanna talk about this product so much that I'm almost investing in it because I'm talking about it so much rather than investing in it because it's really great and truly innovative. And so sometimes there's that blur on YouTube and it's really bad, I gotta fix that. And, and so I vowed never to do that again. Um, 
but yeah, sometimes sometimes that happens, and it's it's a regret. During COVID, my 14-year-old son told me to buy Zoom. I didn't do it. And he told me, let's buy it, let's ride it to the top. I didn't do it. I'm sorry I didn't do it. But back Zoom's back to the IPO price now. Because yeah, everybody's back to work. What you got to catch things. The stock market is basically emotions oh yeah what's and current events let's face it it's news yeah. all right right now you can't find baby formula on the shelves yeah. that's news there's somehow it's tied to a business and a company right maybe it's momentum. a good time to buy it or sell it i don't know buy and for mill i don't know yeah. but, then all of a sudden the supply comes back but and breast oh. machines have gone way up now because there's no formula on the shelves yeah there you go maybe you should start selling breast milk that's it you could pay women to come in. Oh, I thought you meant you, mine. You ain't got none. I could probably get away with it. But, you know, you could pay women to sit there with machines and, and be pumped all day, and you could sell it. Wholesale inventory, breast milk. <laughs> got business ideas here. Let's start a business together. So tell us, when did you stop selling real estate for other people? Yeah, that was a really hard transition because when I first started YouTube, I remember, wow, I'm making $100 a day, and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I'm making $400 a day, and I'm still doing real estate deals for folks. And the average commission for me was around $10,000 would take about three months. So each client was about a 90-day marriage. And then uh, there was a year, 2015, I, I had 52 closings. And that's like 70 clients because not all of them close. And I was stressed beyond belief. And so uh, in 2019, I decided I'm now making more money on YouTube than I could possibly dream of making as an agent. And your own real estate. Uh, and for my own real estate investment properties, that it would make more sense for me to just make more videos because it pays more. And then I can invest in real estate more, which makes really big money investing in real estate. And you're helping people. And, and I'm, I'm scaling my knowledge, see, for the way that I'm providing it. See, a lot of my early videos were really taking my in-person coffee meetings with clients. New buyer comes to me and says, so how do I buy my first home? What's a wedge deal? What's a fixer upper? Why would I get into this? Who am I gonna call? A lot of these were me sitting down for two to three hours with, with potential clients educating them for free solely under the hope that I would get a commission from them. This is the provide value first, get paid later thing. And uh, solely for the hope that they would buy a deal with me. And so when I did one of those three hour presentations and they ended up using a different agent, I felt like I had a knife in my heart. But in sales, you just have to handle that rejection and move on, like next, water under the bridge, next, right? But anyway, uh, that sort of, those discussions about here's how to do it, I put on YouTube. And all of a sudden, instead of helping one person in three hours, I could help 20,000 people in, in three hours. Uh, the, so the scale was unimaginable. And it just didn't make sense to be an agent anymore, not for $10,000 commissions. I could have, you know, some people say, well, why didn't you hire other agents to continue the business for you? I mean, it's, compared to the revenue that we were able to make from our investments or YouTube, it's not even worth the, the headspace. People got to do what feels right for them. Well, and there, there are always going to be levels of income, too. So, for example, when I worked at Jamba Juice, uh, I made more money than when I worked at Hollister. So I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll gladly work more hours at Jamba Juice than Hollister, right? I you worked get to get free juice? Uh, rarely, sometimes. It was like a you know twenty percent off kind of thing. Uh, we got free hamburgers though when I worked at Red Robin, uh, but that you don't want to have that every single shift. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. But anyways, there I made nine dollars. I'm like, I'll gladly work nine dollar an hour shifts. What right? did you do Red Robin? Uh, well, I was hired under the impression that they would make me a, a, a waiter because that was my dream was to be a waiter and provide that customer service. Never made it. I got stuck as a host. And uh, so I was a host for three months and I complained so much that uh, they ended up moving me into the kitchen and said, well, just be a busboy uh, for a bit and check the food on the line. So I had expediter and busing shifts just to, uh, uh, you know, pick up a little bit extra hours. You know what the problem sometimes is when you're really good at a job, a lot of employees don't want you to grow because they like you right where you're at because you're so good, the employer. You know, I do it to people all the time. I'm not letting it go. I mean, I was kidding. I always encourage everybody to move up. I encourage people to get educated, you know, but, you know, a lot of places will hold you back, you know, especially the restaurant business. Ugh, yeah. You know. So what else, uh, I mean, that's that's a compliment. That's like saying I was actually good at doing the dishes. No, you were good as a host. Welcome oh. to Red Robin. Uh, how many people in your party? Oh, uh, let me seat you. 
Thank you. If we did that in New York, you get tips for that shit. Nope. Maitre D, shit, you get in the right restaurant at Maitre D. There are Maitre D's in New York that probably make a quarter million bucks a year oh. easily. Easily. Wow. That's the way it works. All right, what kind of tips and advice could you give to the new real estate agents? New real estate agents are almost very similar to new real estate investors in that they just want it all to fall in their lap. They want to have like their phone ring and the Zillow leads to come in and they don't really want to leave the comfort of their bedroom. It's a big mistake. You need to get out there and meet people. We used to call it belly to belly. Meet people by doing open houses, by knocking on doors, get uncomfortable. I remember standing in a home and the lady walks in. I was holding another agent's open house. I'm standing in the home. And the lady walks in and goes, oh, so what's, what are the schools assigned to this house? And I'm like, yeah, I have no idea. And she looked at me like, wow. And then walked out. And I'm like, well, I'm never letting that happen again. So I always knew the schools from then on. So actually meeting people belly to belly, really, really good. And now in the MLS, they actually tell you what school is in that house zone. We used to call it, they call it, agents would call it farming too. They would go door to door yes. and knock on people's doors. Oh, they call yeah. it farming. Took, hey, you want to sell your house? A great time. I took the original iPad and I took a screenshot of Google Maps of neighborhoods. And then I just put a little pin where I could have like a little note thing pop up. And I'd knock on doors and I'd put on the, on the notes thing uh, the date of when I knocked on their door. And the question I would ask is, when are you planning on selling? Not, are you going to sell? I know yes or no. No, no, when? And people would either say never, or my favorite was like, ah, within the next couple years. I knocked on those doors a year later, 18 months later. It was good. It worked. Follow up, follow up. Oh, another big, my biggest listing uh, as a new agent, my second year in the business, $1.4 million doc home. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like the people on TV in Los Angeles. Million dollar listing. I was so excited. But I got it because I went around and took pictures of the most expensive expired listings where the, the properties didn't sell. Another agent failed to sell the property. So I took a picture of the home and I bought these really big sort of 18 by, I, I don't know, 12 signs, like yard signs. They usually stake and I, I didn't buy the stakes. I just took the sign and I had it printed. Picture your home sold or picture your house sold. And I took the picture that I took of the property, cut it out, and I photoshopped in a, a sold sign with my face on it. And I slapped it there, uh, I, I glued it or taped it to the board, and I would put it in front of their, their door, so like where their doormat is. So when they either opened the door or came home, the first thing they see, picture your house sold, and you pick it up, and it's literally a picture of their home with a sold sign in front of it. That's how I got my first million dollar listing. <laughs> but a lot of people just wiped their feet on his face and went in the house. <laughs> That's also true. I used to pass out pumpkins, and this one guy called me and goes, I don't go to that house but once every three months, and I just came, it's like January, he's like, why is there a rotten pumpkin with your face on it? On my porch, because I put flyers on it with my face. It's like, it's stained the marble. <laughs> and the world's made up of a lot of crazy people. <laughs> How did it feel when you made your first million dollars or you're worth a million bucks? That's really the first major level in everybody's life uh, is when you say, hey, I made it to the million mark. Yeah, I made it to the million dollar mark of, uh, of, of revenue for my business, actually just net income. Within a, a year or two after college. And uh, it was weird. I remember hitting that number and it didn't really feel different to me. I just felt like, all right, that's checked off. What's next? It was the same thing with the net worth aspect. All right, what's next? That's and it, because when you hit a million, then you got to go have a short-term goal to five million. Mm -hmm. And then five turns into 10, and 10 turns into 15, and you know how to count from there. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll never forget. I. Uh, uh, I, I sat in the spa and I was talking to somebody. Uh, I was making $50,000 my second year as an agent, $55,000 a year. And I'm like, you know, next year I'm going to make it a goal uh, to get to uh, six figures of income. And then after that, I want to cross $250,000 a year. The next year I made $141,000. The year after that, I made $295,000. I'm like, I like these goal setting things. <laughs> I mean, that's it. You set goals and you accomplish them. 
Make sure to subscribe to Ben Mala, and thank you for having me on your new Fireside Podcast. Comment down below. More Fireside Podcast.